Well, friends, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week in the sermon, if you were uh, listening to the sermon last week, I talked about how Christians believe in aliens. This week, uh, I want to let you know that Christians actually believe in time travel. Did you know that? All right, all right, but, but maybe to understand what I'm saying, we have to go uh, back in time a little bit uh, to the beginning of creation. And you're probably familiar with the story. In fact, most people are probably familiar a little bit with the story. Back to the beginning of creation, according to the Bible, of course, uh, God makes the whole world and he calls it what? Good, right? And it's called good and good and good and then even very good, right? And he makes Adam. Now, one of the weird quirks I've always thought about creation is how God makes Adam And then he goes and plants a garden and makes food. You know, it's almost kind of interesting, right? Like, I mean, could you imagine being Adam and saying, all right, God, this is awesome. This is beautiful. Nice job. I got a feeling in my gut, though. I'm kind of hungry, right? And God says, yep, watch what I'm going to do. And he goes and he plants a garden with food. A sumptuous feast for Adam. I've also kind of thought that that's kind of a weird design quirk on God's part, isn't it? I mean, if you're starting from absolute scratch and you can make humanity any possible way, right? I mean, doesn't it seem like kind of a design flaw that humans have this constant need for food? Like a constant need to eat? And if we don't eat, what happens? You get kind of hangry, and then you start to not feel so good, and then eventually, right, if you keep on not eating, you die. Doesn't that seem like a design flaw, right? And yet I think God was up to something when he did it that way. God was up to something when he designed people to need food, and I think God was up to something when he put Adam in the garden and then put the garden full of food around him for Adam to watch. I think God was trying to teach Adam that he was dependent on a gracious God who gives abundant gifts through his creation. It was a huge Lesson, And it was the very first lesson that Adam ever learned from God, to depend on God to provide good gifts through his creation. In fact, that's what all of the Garden of Eden really was. Eden was made to be a gift to Adam and to all the other creatures for peace and security and rest. Now, it wasn't a rest like laziness, like we might be used to when we uh, rest on the lazy boy. This is a rest, meaning that all things are working together for good. And was that not true before sin entered the world? No, of course, when, when the world was perfect and sinless, all things truly were working together for good. I don't know what kind of role mosquitoes had in all of that, but I'm sure that they had some sort of role for good, right? (laughs) Maybe not. Maybe they're part of the thorns. Anyway, that brings us up to the next phase in the story, right? Sin. Before sin, God was the good shepherd who provided everything for Adam. The sheep with his shepherd, and creation was a worldwide green pasture to rest and rejoice in. And what does sin do? It destroys all of that. It corrupts all of that. So we fast forward to what I like to call the unedening of creation. Creation no longer looks like the Garden of Eden. It is un-Eden. Creation is cursed. It's full of drought and famine and disaster and thorns. It is full of desolate places. It does not work the way it's supposed to. It is not a gift anymore. Creation is no longer a place of rest. 
Things are no longer working all together for good. Instead, creation is full of war and turmoil and heartache and tragedy. All things seem to work together not for good, but for calamity. Creation is uneden. Why? Because it lacks a shepherd. Adam and Eve, the sheep, wander away. No, they reject their good shepherd. Adam wanders like a sheep in a dangerous and desolate place where food is scarce. Death waits around every corner. And we see at the end of this tragic story of the unedening of creation that creation needs to be made right. You know, that's what we believe as Christians, by the way, isn't it? That one day Jesus will come back, and indeed he will re-eden the whole world. He will make creation right. You, dear Christian, will live in a world one day like Adam and Eve did before, but guess what? It will be better. Better than Adam and Eve actually had it. All of the world will be re-edened. You will live in a place of security and rest where all things indeed again work together for good. You're like, Pastor, that's great, but what does that have to do with time travel? You said you were going to tell me about time travel. <laughs> well, let's talk about time travel. Jesus brings the future into the past. You heard about this in our gospel reading today, the feeding of the 5,000. Did you know that that was actually a story about time travel in a way? Where Jesus brings the future into the past? You know the story. You just heard it. Jesus was, um, t- he was teaching the multitude with his disciples. He was out in this desolate place. And then finally, it starts to get late, right? And if it's been a long day and you've been walking around a long time, what are you thinking about the most? Dinner, right? And people start to get hungry. But the problem is that the crowd is still in a desolate place. They parked all the cars really far away, and then they were walking and following Jesus, right? Food is scarce, and they have no rest because they have no food. Now they're in kind of a tight situation. What are they going to do for the night? And you don't just have a few people here having a bad camping trip with Jesus. You've got over 5,000 people. But guess what? They had a shepherd. So the disciples know this. They know Jesus is the good shepherd. They come up to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, we got a little bit of a problem here, Uh, a little bit of a a planning uh, snafu. Uh, we got 5,000 people here, and they don't have food. What do we do? And Jesus says, I love this line, right? You give them something to eat. (laughs) Thanks, Jesus. Okay. And you know how the rest of the story goes. Five loaves, two fish, 5,000 people, and enough to feed them all. Now, here's the interesting part, is that you as the reader, if you're reading the story for the first time, you don't find out that there's over 5,000 people there until the end of the story. But the disciples can clearly see before them 5,000 people. So I I, I just picture what it was like when they brought to Jesus five loaves and two fish, right? (laughs) Hey, Jesus, here's all the food we got. Somebody pack some snacks for the trip. Five loaves and two fish. I, I, I can't imagine they were actually being that serious. It was like, Jesus, this is actually a problem. You've got to pay attention. And what does Jesus do? He commands the crowds to rest in a desolate place. And I, I, like, I, I like how we get this little detail in verse 39, that he, Jesus tells them to rest on the what? Green grass. I thought it was a desolate place. When you think of desolate places, you think of brown grass, right? Maybe some dirt. There, no growth, no kind of plant life whatsoever. And 
it's almost like it's a little miracle that Jesus accomplishes before the big one, right? Rest in the green grass. I think this is Mark's hint that Jesus is up to something. And then the story goes on. In fact, I would say that this is where the time travel comes in because Jesus brings the future into the past, the future where there is abundance, there's super abundance. We are taken care of, we are filled and satisfied, and creation is itself providing all the gifts from God of food, more food than we can possibly imagine. What happens with Jesus? He blesses the bread, and he opens the first olive garden with unlimited breadsticks, right? (laughs) Jesus takes the bread, breaks it, blesses it, and gives it to his disciples. And they take that bread and they keep on distributing it and distributing it and distributing it. And so everybody, over 5,000 people eat. And it wasn't just like a hold you over sort of eat. Think Thanksgiving. They eat and they are satisfied. Because what do you do after you have a really full belly? Oh, you rest, right? They have so much food that they now have 12 baskets of leftovers. Friends, This is Jesus bringing the future, new creation, into the past. This is a kingdom moment. Jesus was re-edening creation. For this moment, people got a glimpse of the kingdom and what Jesus would do. Now fast forward to today. And I think it's fair to say that we still find ourselves in what I would like to call an unedened world. And I think you know what that means, right? That we live in an, an unedened world where things are still not the way that sh- they should be. Things are still corrupt. Things still don't work the way they should. Creation is not a gift. And we can see this unedened world because without a shepherd, we are sheep without a shepherd. Without Jesus, we are like wandering sheep. And we live by corrupt philosophies, spinning moral compasses, and tangling lies. If you live by a creed, or you live by a narrative or story or worldview that does not come entirely from Jesus, you are a sheep without a shepherd. No shepherd means that you have no purpose, no hope, no identity, no destiny. You need to depend on a shepherd. Sheep were made to have a shepherd. But even if you do have Jesus as your shepherd, as Christians do, we still find ourselves in desolate places. Christians don't get to spend all their time at Chuck E. Cheese. And most parents are saying, and I wouldn't want to either, right? We still find ourselves in desolate places, and I would say, I would even argue that desolate desolate places still have a way of finding us, don't they? It's these situations that you wonder if you'll ever make it through. It might be the hardship of parenting kids. Maybe it's picking up a loved one from the police station after their DUI. Desolate places might mean you're caring for an aging parent. Desolate places might mean loving someone with a different worldview than you have, or maybe watching somebody you love go on that course toward rock bottom. Life is full of desolate places. And here's the lie that Satan would like you to believe, that you have to handle those times, have to handle those desolate places all by yourself, that you are independent. When the reality, friends, is that all we ever have 
That's something that amounts to five loaves and two fish for 5,000 people. It's not going to work. You weren't made to be independent. You were made to have a shepherd, to depend on a shepherd. And the good news is this, friends, is that you have a time-traveling shepherd, Jesus. He died and rose again to bring eternal peace and rest from the future new creation to you in the present now. You have those gifts of the new creation here today, forgiveness and peace and rest. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, reaches 2,000 years into the past to bring you that same forgiveness and peace from the cross to you right now in the present. Do you see what Jesus is doing, friends? Jesus is re edening the whole world. And one day, the world will be so re eden that Jesus will come again to finish the job. He, by his word, when he returns, will make all things new. And one day when he returns, all of creation will be transformed into a super abundant place of rest and gifts. Friends, that is what we look forward to. A shepherd time traveling us into that future new creation. But look what Jesus does too. He time travels that future new life into days, into today's desolate places. Jesus makes creation abundant even for you right now. Jesus does this by taking simple bread. He blesses it. He breaks it. And he gives it to his disciples. He makes creation abundant. His true body given for you to fill you and satisfy you with eternal life and forgiveness and hope. Friends, like Adam in the beginning, you were designed to have a shepherd to be dependent on God. And you might be in a desolate place right now. You might only have a meager five loaves and two fish. And maybe you're not sure how you'll make it through. But being a sheep is not about what you can accomplish in this life. Being a sheep is about what the shepherd accomplishes through our world. Friends, as you serve and care for others, and if you, as you serve and care for God's good creation around you, Jesus works all things, even something like five loaves and two fish, works all things for the good of his creation. We gather today because Jesus is still working through his creation, proclaiming his word, baptizing disciples. And we get to feast on the body and blood of Jesus, our shepherd. Our shepherd uses creation to abundantly transform creation. Okay, so we don't actually believe in time travel. <laughs> We don't actually believe that we are being transported through time or anything like that kind of stuff. But I hope you get what I'm saying. Jesus brings the reign of God abundantly to creation for the sake of bringing rest to his people in the age to come. That's what he's doing. That's what the, this whole Jesus thing is all about. Restoring his good world for you. Which means that as Christians, we find satisfaction in our shepherd who gives us new creation life right now. 
Friends, you get to live right now like you will in the future as a sheep with your shepherd. Happy time traveling. In Jesus' name, amen.